introduce you. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you Alex Gray, who is Vice President for Foundation of AI in IBM. Uh, Alex, uh, uh, Alex did his uh, BA in Applied Mathematics in Berkeley and then his PhD in CMU. He was a member of uh, NASA and faculty member of Georgia Tech. And he also founded a startup, AI startup. Uh, 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 Alex has a lot of recognition. Let me mention one. He was a Cavalry Scholar in National Academy of Science. He was a member of Massive Data Committee for National Academy of Science. I like very much uh, uh, one of his last sentence in his biography, which I want to read it to you. His current interest generally result around the injection of non-mainstream ideas into MLAI to attempt to break through long-standing bottlenecks of the field. And I think Alex will tell us a little bit more about this today. Alex, please. All right, thanks everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks, Wojtek, for the kind invitation and introduction. So uh, thanks, everyone, for taking the time. So uh, let me, I'm going to talk about unifying. This is one of those long-standing bottlenecks. Um, my, my current primary interest is uh, sort of the big disconnect between classical AI uh, or symbolic or logical AI and statistical uh, or machine learning based AI. Roughly speaking to the two big paradigms of AI that never have quite been resolved with each other. So um, this is uh, on information. I'll come back to it at the very end. So uh, um, unfortunately, I won't tell you any solutions about anything information related. I'm just gonna give you questions. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. and. Uh, Hope you'll find some of those questions uh, uh, fun and interesting. Uh, we're definitely looking for some uh, collaborations. Uh, if any of you have any interest in any of this, if not, well, hopefully it uh, allowed you to kill an hour of time with a little bit of mild entertainment. So, but here's here's a bigger context for IBM. So we just started this uh, uh, program called the Informational Lens. And this picture may surprise you. It's the actual, sometimes given as the you know, cartoon summary of IBM research, which is like 3,000 uh, researchers. And you can see right in the middle here is uh, sort of three kinds of bits, you could say. Um, regular bits, neurons, and qubits as a kind of unifying theme. Now, just what I'll show you is a very a direct um, uh, correspondence between the first two. So qubits, we're not gonna talk about except mention at the very end. Though, as you know, we have a very big quantum uh, research activity at IBM. Okay, um, so these are the two big research programs um, kind of connected with this. So mainly I'm gonna tell you about this neurosymbolic connection and then It'll raise a bunch of questions, I hope uh, we we'll find some interest in. So, um, <clears throat> let's see, let me adjust my screen here. Okay, so, uh, so I'm trying to get rid of this uh, Zoom thing, grid. <laughs> okay, all right, so um, this is a, a little cartoon of what you know, an increasing number of groups, but still very small, actually, incredibly small. But in the last two years, especially, there's been renewed interest in this. You could say, my, my view anyway, is that people are starting to see maybe the end of, <laughs> of uh, a certain train of ideas, um, or at least uh, a need for some new ideas in the field. More or less, we're dominated by deep learning today in AI, which of course has brought us a lot of uh, really great empirical results and um, you know, uh, new capabilities. But to me, we're, we're sort of, uh, it's sort of about that time. 
uh, roughly speaking, every decade or so in AI, we, at least in machine learning, we, we sort of, uh, it's sort of time for something new. So this is my opinion on the kind of thing we need. So um, you see here on the left, statistical AI capabilities on the right, symbolic AI, and some attempts uh, to bridge them. And there was a great talk at the last AAAI conference uh, by Henry Potts, and he gave this categorization of some of the recent attempts uh, to unify them. Um, here are the most common types of goals, and, you, and these more or less point to ways or things that people desire from deep learning, but are not really getting, you could say. Um, understandability. Uh, you know, if you have a logical representation of knowledge, you have a human readable form. Now, where essentially all of these things, I argue, uh, you know, uh, don't stand up to, uh, to that. Uh, they, they still maintain two representations. And because of that, one of them is a black box, is the neural net that we're trying to understand but can't. The second one um, is that you can be more general if you represent knowledge very generally as you do in symbolic AI. It's then reusable for many tasks in principle. However, these um, models tend not to be compositional um, and, uh, and therefore not, I argue, very reusable. And of course, you also hope to gain uh, the ability to do more complex problems like uh, things that require reasoning. Okay. Um, however, most of these approaches, uh, almost all of them uh, arguably do a very, some, some dumbing down of full-blown full -blown reasoning that you have in classical AI, uh, either with simpler logics or the kind of reasoning that's not actually rigorous or you know, uh, provable in terms of quality of results. Okay, um, so that's sort of uh, some motivation that we came up effectively. What I'll show you is you could say is a seventh category, which might be a surprising one, given the general characterization that these two things are at odds or sort of opposites, statistical AI and symbolic AI. Um, we actually, I'll, I'll show you, it's the main punchline of this talk, uh, that there's a sense in which they are the same. Or you could say there's a big overlap region where the things in that region are actually, you know, uh, uh, major parts of, of each paradigm. Okay, so, um, and because of that, the upshot of that will be that you'll have a single representation, which happens to be human readable. Um, the models are composable or modular or reusable, are models of, are of knowledge. And you, in fact, do have a rigorous foundation for reasoning. Uh, in fact, neural nets, regular, real neural nets, not you know simple forms of neural nets, uh, become a special case, and classical logic becomes a special case. Okay. <clears throat> so let me start on that. This will take about twenty minutes or so uh, to get to that punchline, and then I'll talk about some. Uh, extra work on top of it. And then I'll finally I'll get to some information questions. So here's a starting point. Um, so the original, the very first artificial neural net paper was uh, McCulloch and Pitts. And here was their neuron. So basically what they pointed out uh, was the equivalence of this kind of a gate logical gate and, um, or sorry, this kind of a neuron model and uh, all of those standard no, uh, logic gates. Okay, here, there are no weights um, on these arcs and the activation function is a step function. What they showed was for different values, you can achieve any of the standard gates, the threshold type concept. Okay, now this, this is a direct, you know, and that was the whole point of the paper was the neuron, uh, 
is a, is a logical gate. That idea, uh, more or less, wasn't built on, uh, which seems strange to me since that was the very first, uh, you know, it, was, it, it sort of drifted off into other things. So the next big leap you could say in neural net models was uh, the perceptron, where now you do have weights um, and you still have a step function. The important thing here, of course, was in introduction of a learning scheme to learn these weights. Now the connection with logic is maintained here because uh, you can show that uh, for some constrained region of the weights, uh, you achieve and behavior and uh, so on for or and, and other gates. Okay, so you still have a connection between logic and uh, neurons. Next, you could say a big leap in the history of neural nets was um, putting together multiple neurons to uh, fit more complex functions. Then you need gradients, um, backprop. So now uh, this a step function turns into something differentiable um, like a sigmoid and later on a rectified linear unit. So that's great, but uh, the connection to logic is now a little, it's sort of suddenly gone because, uh, at least in a straightforward way, because, well, for one thing, this output is not just zero or one. It can be some number between zero and one. Okay, so at least uh, classical logic is no longer obvious as an interpretation here. One thing we can do However, this is uh, now we start to apply some modifications to maintain this connection uh, between neurons and logic. So we can say, well, these red regions here near the end points of the activation function, we can uh, say, we can try to enforce that uh, if you're close to zero or one at least, then uh, it's, it will behave like a classical um, logic gate. Okay, um, so uh, this introduces the idea of a constraint, um, constraints in your optimization of the weights. Okay, um, great. Now, uh, to finish that, you sort of, as, as commonly done, add some slack variables. These are important because um, this allows you to uh, determine a degree of adherence to logical behavior. Okay, so for example, for very large values of the slack uh, variables, you have no adherence to uh, logical constraints and you're just a regular neuron. Okay, this actually allows you to mix and match uh, these you know, logic interpreted neurons and sort of regular uh, neurons or sub-symbolic. Okay, um, so here we, we again have our region in which, uh, of, of the weight space in which uh, you have an and behavior setting. Okay, but uh, still not, we're still not quite done because we still need to address what happens in this sort of in between region between uh, the endpoints of near zero and near one. So uh, some of you may be may have been saying, hey, wait a minute, there are such things as real valued logics. Okay, these are logics where um, the truth value is not just zero or one, but somewhere between zero and one. So uh, here are some common ones that have been uh, developed and used um, over time. Indeed, it's not like these are very new. Um, you know, these, these are almost as old as mathematical logic Itself. So um, now all of these things, these various logics, they behave like classical logic um, at the extremes of zero and one, where the inputs are either zero or one, but they differ in their behavior uh, for in-between values. Importantly for this topic, um, this, these actually can capture probabilities. I'll come back to that. Uh, later. Okay, um, 
and of course, fuzzy logics were uh, probably the most well-known. Uh, girdle logic is very close to what we call Zade logic. Um, these are popularized by Zade in the 60s. So um, <clears throat> now here's, uh, here's a, something that may be surprising. So let's take arguably the most common one, the Kashawish logic we find like this and look at a uh, plot of the and uh, function, the and gate, or you know, varying values of p and q, the two inputs. So you see it looks like this, and this happens to be the, or if you're a neural net person, you're saying to yourself, oh, that's the rectified linear unit activation function. So this is a very fortuitous connection. It so happens that the ReLU more or less is the modern activation function. That is what people use today. Um, okay, so, so there you're already starting to see, hopefully, a very close connection. Now, there are no weights though in these equations and a neuron of course has weights, a modern neuron. So no problem, you can easily define a weighted version of say Bukashua's logic. We can do this for any of those real value logics. I uh, forgot to mention the sigmoid, of course you can make a, a sigmoid logic easily. And so there's the regular old sigmoidal uh, neuron, you know, all this applies as well. So now you can have a rigorous logical semantics for your neuron. Okay, and the, the role of the weights yeah, are, is also interpretable as expressing the relative importance of inputs. Okay, um, <clears throat> now this is cool, but uh, we need one more thing. Um, for a logical system, we need both a representation of the information, or in other words, a logical language, um, but we also need operations that you do on logic statements um, or inference rules. So for example, you uh, for those of you may need to dust off your logic um, from your <laughs> AI class or, or, uh, or whatever, or maybe your, your hardware class, so modus ponens, um, at least is, is pretty intuitive. It says, if you know that P is true and you know that P implies Q, well, that entails that Q is true. Pretty obvious. So, and there are a whole bunch of other ones. Okay, so these are steps that let you reach uh, new truth values, given other truth values. Now, how do you know if a logical system, which is the logical language plus its inference rules, is sound or is good? So there are two sort of, you know, um, uh, canonical things that you want to show about any logical system. One is that it's sound, and that means that you can't sort of get garbage um, by applying the inference rules to statements. Everything will be valid um, that you conclude, and Completeness, which is that um, you, can only, you only get, or if, if you have a valid formula, it can be derived uh, eventually somehow from the axioms by applying the inference rules, okay? So this is sort of basic if you have a logical system. Now, these real valued logic, surprisingly, um, this had not been fully established, even surprising because of you know, how old and it's not like they haven't been treated by mathematicians. It's a very mathematical area. So um, uh, now we are one of our uh, famous logicians, uh, Ron Fagan actually showed this, it showed soundness and strong completeness, um, surprisingly for the first time for this, these, all of these logics basically. So, uh, I put, uh, oops, there's a note to myself to fill in the archive reference <laughs> down below the question mark. So since there's an archive paper you can read. So um, now this is great. So, uh, but what he shows in that paper, what we show in that paper is that uh, it's a decision procedure. 
um, which it can be cast as a mixed integer linear program. That's great, but that's expensive. So um, we would like a cheaper uh, procedure to implement such inference rules. Um, and that also corresponds to the kind of message passing uh, idea that you have in neural net infrastructure like PyTorch, okay? Um, that would complete or help complete the correspondence. So um, now there's one, one uh, first conceptual obstacle though. So let's pretend this, this neuron is uh, implies actually instead of and. And then let's consider the modus ponens rule I just mentioned. So P and Q would be inputs at the bottom and P implies Q would be the output at the top. So, so modus ponens says, if I know P is true, which is at the bottom, that's an input. And I know P implies Q, which is the output. Then uh, I, can, I can know that Q is true, but that's another input. So that's saying, given the output and, an, and, and one of the inputs, find another one of the inputs. So the, the information flow, so to speak, is backward. Um, so as opposed to what's normally done in a neural net. Okay, but that's okay. We can define, you know, as long as F, the activation function is invertible, and just define what it means to how you get one of the Xs, one of the inputs um, given the output. Okay, um, and you can define a, a propagation scheme through such an, a network of such neurons as uh, shown. Um, okay, so that's great. You can still define uh, what it means to go backward in such a logical neuron. We do need to add one more thing though, um, because depending on your activation function F, your truth um, values may not be unique that you get from this uh, inverting F. So, but you uh, will get some bounds generally, as long as it's monotonic. Um, Okay, so that introduces the idea of truth value bound to lower and upper bound. And we generalize the whole thing to propagate these bounds. Now that started out just sort of to make it work, but it turns out that's uh, very useful. In fact, we now think it's sort of critical in a real system because it lets you, um, it lets you represent ignorance um, and that's really important because in general, you won't, in a real system, you won't have full knowledge of the world. Okay, um, just a little mention about the connection probabilities, which I can now talk about because we have the concept of truth bounds. Um, if you, you sort of use a hybrid activation function, then you can, uh, it, this corresponds to bounds on probabilities. And we can show that. Okay, that's, these bounds make no assumptions about independence or conditional probabilities between variables. And I'll address that later. So, okay, so, um, so now we have this funny, you know, or let's imagine uh, stringing together a bunch of these neurons to make logic statements. And uh, an example here, uh, this is a real network that we use and then use case I'll show you later. So take this middle one here at the top. This says, this is a logical statement which says, if you're a person X and you're born in a, con uh, a place A and A is part of some other place B, then that means you're also born in the place B. So for example, if you're born in uh, New York City, it also means you're born in New York State. Okay, so, uh, and that also means you're born in the United States. So, um, that's an, you know, uh, this is how you show these. So in other words, logic statements uh, correspond to graphs, which are the, just the abstract syntax trees of, of, their, of those statements. Um, so a neural network is just uh, uh, 
a logic statement drawn as a graph. Okay, so, all right, and at the bottom is shown sort of a, you know how you um, you typically uh, how this maps to knowledge. Knowledge is generally stored in a knowledge graph, like the thing at the lower right, or a relational database, you could say. So um, this maps to a native representation of a either a relational database or a graph database. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, and you know your regular knowledge in quotes that you feed into regular machine learning is a table, um, and so any so a regular table, you can write our machine learning table, you can express this way. So this generalizes, when you think of this as a machine learning model, you, it generalizes the normal uh, supervised learning model in that any variable can be either an input or an output. And so the, the inputs are any subset of the variables, the out, outputs are any subset of the variables. Worlds instead of training examples, we'll generalize that to worlds, which is just a set of variables, a snapshot of the values of a set of variables, um, some inputs and some outputs. Yet we generalize the idea of missing data handling, these bounds. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now the learning problem, we modify slightly. So the regular um, loss function is this you know, upper left. Then we add something to account for the fact that we have, we have uh, uh, really many variables that are outputs um, or tasks as they're sometimes called in the machine learning literature. Variables, target variables are often called tasks. So here basically we're, we're enforcing, um, we're trying to minimize with this term the contradiction between uh, different variables because we're accounting for the fact that you may have um, inconsistent knowledge in practice. Some part of your knowledge base may say for, for some reason, Barack Obama is the president of the United States and some part of it may say someone else is the president. So, um, okay, so this uh, term enforces that or tries to uh, make everything work together, you could say. Uh, it's, it's enforcing logical consistency. Okay, um, now this optimization problem is, um, is a little bit more difficult than the normal one, the normal neural net one. And I'll say more about that later. So we have a few approaches to deal with it. And, you know, the most obvious thing is there are constraints. We have at least three approaches that we've been uh, playing with. So um, <clears throat> now uh, this is the punchline here. So we'll put all that together and you could say with uh, a regular neural net, possibly with constraints, you actually don't need those constraints. So those are just to make it act more like classical logic. But even if you take those constraints out, it's still equivalent uh, to a, a kind of logic, it's just a weighted real value logic, okay? Um, and then logical inference, if you add to a normal neural net, the idea of reverse in, inference, uh, then that's, we show that that's equivalent to uh, logical inference general logical inference, like modus ponens and, and other things, okay? So, um, so in other words, neural net and logic statements are just renderings of the same model. So it's a kind of uh, particle wave duality, you could say. <laughs> um, classical logic is exactly a special case. Uh, regular neural nets, which meaning normal, modern activation functions, recurrent, deep, and so on, our special case. So, um, and uh, you can mix and match. Actually, it doesn't all have to be logically, um, you know, uh, interpretable. So, um, some of the, you know, we did a 
our own survey, of course, of the all the ideas out there that we could find trying to do this kind of bridging between uh, neuro and symbolic. The two major idea camps you could say are, um, uh, well, probably the, the best known and roughly around 2006 or so, uh, idea like this is called uh, Markov logic networks based on the idea of Markov random fields. Their logic statements become cliques of terms in a Markov random field. This is not compositional. So, um, and uh, logical inference becomes this big uh, Monte Carlo sampling procedure. So, uh, it becomes a, a satisfiability problem. So um, this is an example of what I mean by it. It's not uh, provable uh, logical inference in, in the senses that I showed. So if you sample to infinity, you know, you could prove something, but now, um, and uh, the other kind of more recent kind of idea is that many people are, you know, uh, seem to gravitate toward is the idea of um, the basic representation of concepts not being uh, discrete ver you know, nodes or variables as I showed in this model, but uh, a distributed notion where, where it's a point in some high dimensional space or an embedding. So say 10,000 dimensions or something or 500 dimensions or whatever. Now, and, but you're sort of doing logic um, on, uh, you define a way of doing logic on these vectors. So there is something interesting about that, I, I feel. And, um, but so far at least this approach doesn't yield any sort of, uh, you know, reasoning with provable properties. And when you actually, at least the state of things at the moment, if you try to actually do reasoning with it, in benchmarks and so on, it doesn't do very well at all. So, <clears throat> okay, nonetheless, uh, I do think there's something good about this idea that we'll, we'll come to later. Um, so uh, our thing, logical neural networks or LNN, of course, is exactly also logic and therefore can do logic precisely um, and can even compete in their improving benchmarks and so on, which we're doing now. And we show that it, of course, it, does better empirically and so on. Okay, so that's it. That's uh, logical neural networks, the idea. <clears throat> now, let me show you some uh, things we're building upon that. Uh, so so our, our major use case of interest is at the moment is this one. So we want, wanted to find something uh, that is really hard for regular neural nets today say they are default AI, deep learning, end-to-end -end deep learning. So one example of something where end-to-end -end deep learning does, in, <laughs> I think empirically very badly, so objectively very badly, is um, something called knowledge-based er, question answering. And here's a simple form of question answering. Um, these are factoid type questions and you're, you get to assume that you have a knowledge base, which is normally a knowledge graph, um, like this, uh, DBpedia, which this is just showing here. Uh, DBpedia is a knowledge graph that's uh, representing all the, or as, as, as much as possible, the facts in Wikipedia. Okay, so it's very large. Um, and here's an example of a factoid type question in one of these so-called KBQA data sets. Uh, was Roger Federer born in the United States? So um, now what the facts that are actually in DBpedia, it's, it says that his birthplace is Basel. And somewhere else it says that Basel is uh, part of Switzerland. And um, you can do you know, some, some, somewhere also, it says Switzerland is a country, and somewhere else it says USA is a country. So, um, so it may surprise you. We do a bit of reasoning, although we may 
We may not be conscious of it, but this simple question requires reasoning. So to answer correctly, you have to uh, put together these facts and know also that um, if you're born, you have to know that if you're born in Basel, you're also born in Switzerland. Um, and if you're uh, born in one place, you're not born in another place, uh, if they're of the same sort of uh, level, like the countries, okay? So <clears throat> putting all that together, you can conclude that no, because he's born in Switzerland, he's not born in the United States. So, um, all right, so, uh, um, so here are two of these kinds of data sets, QALD and LC quad. So notice, well, wh why is uh, deep learning sort of, uh, why is this difficult for deep learning? Well, the way you set this up, you know, to me, um, you know, I was mostly a machine learning guy. <laughs> so I can, uh, I feel I have the right to criticize machine learning. So, oh, that's easy to me. Oh. oh, sorry. We have a. Uh, can someone mute me? Um. Sorry. Could I think there's someone uh, who's audio on? So you know when you set this up as a machine learning problem, machine learning has a sort of you could say a very narrow bottleneck. You have to squeeze all problems into. You're, you're gonna predict a, if you set it up as classification or possibly regression normally, and you have to predict, uh, you know, some variable given other variables. So to set up question answering as supervised learning, you, uh, you have a pile of um, candidate question, or sorry, answer sentences. And you're just selecting which one of those is the best uh, possible answer given question. And generally using essentially superficial information like the words and um, you know, maybe some bit more sophisticated information like the usage statistics uh, um, sequentially on words, which are what goes into an embedding. So, but you can't go beyond canned answers generally. So. Um, furthermore, the systems that are state of the art. So when I say deep learning does terribly, I mean like, you know, 33% or something, um, you know, even on these simple data sets. So, um, and generally they, they of course rely completely on training data. And, and so they don't tend to generalize. People don't tend to show results on more than one of these uh, data sets. So no single system generalizes to multiple uh, of these question answering data sets. Okay, this is also a really bad scenario for deep learning because these are small uh, training sets. Deep learning really is hungry for tens of thousands or millions of examples, labeled examples. Okay, now compare that to the space of all possible sentences, which is combinatorial. Okay, so to me, I will argue that you know, I think many people are just hoping you, you pump in an infinite amount of data <laughs> and it'll sort of, a, the intelligence will develop, uh, will emerge. So I'll, to me, it's unclear whether you even have enough sentences in the entire internet to uh, achieve this because it's a combinatorial space. Okay, and furthermore, there's no way you could explain the answer with, uh, with these kinds of models. Okay, so, um, so we thought that was a good kind of a showcase if we could get state-of-the-art results, and we, we did so last year. Um, so we showed that uh, not only on one, but so two of these things we beat to state-of-the-art. So, uh, and um, this seems to be, I'll say this uh, perhaps controversially, it's the first thing that is a pre-existing benchmark that a neurosymbolic um, method, you know, wins on and beats, beats the existing state of the art. So uh, though, 
I'm sure someone will correct me on something. So uh, importantly, you know, one of our goals at least is understandability. So we uh, start, here's a start that we have on how to take a regular human through an explanation of uh, why our model uh, concludes the answer is no for this question, this Roger Federer question. So, and trying to illustrate, you know, which pieces of knowledge are used and uh, the logical steps that are taken to uh, come to the conclusion. And this, of course, is not something you can do really with a uh, regular neural net. So, um, and, you know, the bar we're hoping for is regular humans. In other words, not someone with a PhD in, in uh, logic or anything. Now, um, one of the other sort of uh, uh, obstacles you, you could say are challenges for this whole paradigm is the, uh, you know, people go, oh, reasoning, theorem proving, that's combinatorial. Um, this, is, uh, this is hard computational territory. True. So um, we're uh, working, uh, we actually just got some good results on using reinforcement learning to not uh, explore the whole space you know, blindly, but um, learn uh, how to search the space based on some examples of successful uh, proofs. And uh, we showed that we can even beat um, you know, one of the two best um, theorem provers out there uh, called E. So this is a result of you know many, many years of hand tuning um, and human heuristics for uh, automated theorem proving. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing you may, may have uh, been wondering is, okay, but this relies on feeding in human knowledge like from DBPD or something. True. So this, um, you need some way of adding more neurons or, or knowledge. So, because you'll never have all of the knowledge that you need. So this, uh, so one version of this is just uh, learning new logical rules. Um, uh, this is based on facts that you already have, finding new relationships, which can add new neurons. And we just showed that uh, we have a procedure, which is the um, uh, state of the art now in, in uh, logical rule induction or sometimes called inductive logic programming. Okay, now to the optimization, which the, you know, the computational problem of learning. So um, there's a few sort of challenges. One, the objective is non-convex, um, as in regular neural nets. These bounds are non-smooth and you have constraints, but they're not simple constraints that contain linear, non-linear couplings. So there are some paradigms of you know, classes of optimization approaches that can treat this kind of a problem. Here are the state-of-the-art ones. And uh, we show that we have state-of-the-art convergence rate and empirically do better than uh, all of these approaches. Okay. Uh, and it can be made distributed, which we haven't uh, implemented yet, but will soon. This is a fancy approach for those of you who are optimization folks. Um, <clears throat> now, um, sort of try to complete our picture of what, what could a post deep learning method look like. You could say the complete AI solution of today's default AI is not just deep learning, it's deep learning plus RL, deep RL. So what is our version of deep RL? So for example, you know, deep RL was the solution to AlphaGo that was used. So what is the logical neural network uh, version of RL? So, so this uh, is a whole um, prong that we've been working on. So the idea is that, or the hope is that because we have knowledge and we can easily, humans can easily add domain knowledge um, in logical form, uh, now suppose you have knowledge of your domain, which 
as opposed to going completely blind, which is what today's uh, model three RL is the default, that's what it does. But what if you have some knowledge that should allow you to dramatically reduce the number of trials needed? So RL, you know, if you've ever used it, um, requires a huge, huge number of trials. Um, so uh, this idea is to induce a policy using this in the form of logical rules and um, to try to summarize in logical rules uh, the policy. And using this, we do show some uh, large factors of improvement over regular RL so far. So um, we're working a lot more on that. So. <clears throat> So this, um, with this approach, you, you're starting to see, hopefully you have a little bit of shift in thinking, which is maybe counterintuitive, maybe even controversial. <laughs> so the irregular paradigm on the upper left, you've generally got one task or variable. You've got some labeled data, you've got some unlabeled data and the human participation is to supply some labels, as many labels as you can squeeze out of humans. On the right, um, first of all, the model I've drawn it now is, uh, you know, is, uh, parts of it are understandable. You can have some parts which are little sub pockets, which are regular neural nets, which are not understandable, but they're contained. Um, and they're just, the regular neural nets are just to, you know, fit functions. Um, and the human, uh, adds extra thing, which is knowledge and unsupervised and or, or unlabeled and labeled data are both special cases of knowledge. Um, but the human can also supply higher level knowledge, like uh, the kinds of things we've mentioned. And so the human plays, you could say, the human can also see the outcome of uh, trying the model on say a question answer, question answering task, see which um, facts are inconsistent, uh, which, which facts are missing, maybe, or so on, and then add to the knowledge. So it becomes a much more of a participatory process. Okay. <clears throat> um, there, you know, this may be uh, welcome <laughs> for all the people who are afraid uh, that, you know, right now, today's AI has nothing to do with humans, basically. Humans are not needed, you could say. The truth is they really are. They just can only provide their help in this limited form of labels. Okay, now to bigger questions like, um, what does this say about artificial general intelligence, which you know has no strict definition, but more or less is you know science fiction AI. <laughs> so um, this list of desiderata I sort of boiled down from a recent uh, Twitter war between uh, Bengio and uh, uh, Gary Marcus, you know, more or less representing the two opposite camps, neural nets and symbolic AI. And here's a rough scorecard. This is also sort of very qualitative, of course, and uh, subjective. But, you know, and of, I'm of course biased, but uh, on the far right here, uh, you know, we have ways to achieve all of these desiderata, either have them already conceptually in the approach or there are things that are, you know, we're about to, to uh, send out and publish. This last one is, um, um, is a, the holy grail in a way, uh, which I'll come to, which is the ability to learn with dramatically less data. So it's been shown in some very limited ways, but, you know, no one really knows how to do that, uh, more or less, and generalize some new domains easily. And uh, we don't either, but it's a, it's a very high interest of ours. So I'll show you that. So um, <clears throat> now here's some ongoing directions and uh, we're seeking collaborators on any and all of these things. Of course, more on the natural language understanding this is a very big effort. Scaling in terms of uh, algorithms, uh, high performance computing, databases. Um, the we're LNN 2.0 could say are working on now is a, a, a takes advantage of what or represents richer probabilistic information um, 
like conditional probabilities so that it uh, can subsume Bayes nets, what Bayes nets can do. That's the general thrust. Um, and then, uh, because the current treatment of probabilities is agnostic to uh, correlations or, or uh, conditional independencies. Okay, um, adding embeddings, which I'll describe in a second. Um, of course, uh, beefing up of the logic I basically showed first order logic, but actually it was grounded. So um, we're working on a lifted version now where you can actually do symbolic manipulation, for example, and higher order, which you need for a number of things, including temporal logic. It's a big focus of ours right now. And of course, automatically acquiring knowledge and uh, the various kinds of learning. Okay, so, um, so now let me just, just two more slides. And I just wanna take you through some things that I would love for all of your big brains to uh, get excited about, <laughs> get excited about with some of these things. So um, now this, we're starting to think about connections to neuroscience and we have some, uh, our own internal neuroscientists um, starting to, to help on this. But there's this big question, um, which many people are, are sort of a polarizing question, uh, it turns out, but there's this idea or this question of how you represent, um, how does a neuron encode information? Is it actually a concept or is it really just one, you know, providing some weights in a long vector effectively that represents the concept? or a distributed approach. The, the um, poll that says it's a concept is, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, funny version of this is, you know, is this, is this neuron representing the idea of my grandmother, the so-called grandmother cell hypothesis? So LNN, as I've showed you so far, is basically taking that approach it's saying every neuron is a concept. That, of course, has advantages that we wanted, which is that now you can interpret um, each and every neuron, unlike a normal neural net. Um, however, uh, some advantages, I think, to the embedding idea, which is where it's distributed, are that, you know, uh, maybe if information is corrupt, see, one, one problem you could say with this strict grandmother cell version is that if you, you know, delete a neuron, you could be really screwed. <laughs> so, um, so maybe it's not robust to errors. Um, also, if you happen to, uh, which is the next uh, thing here, if you happen to have a fact that's wrong, um, you know, uh, first of all, that is that, how disastrous is that? So um, we want to study resistance to misinformation. And uh, related to that is lack of information, um, which we can represent explicitly for our ignorance uh, you know, bounds. So uh, for example, what's the maximum incorrect knowledge that can still lead to the correct answer? This is kind of related to neural encoding too, because it's, um, you know, if uh, arguably an embedding might spread out just sort of a, a bad effect of any anything that's a little long. So, um, <clears throat> okay, but clearly we do somewhere, there's got to be some kind of arguably grandmother cell thing going on. Um, pardon, and there is some evidence neuroscientifically as well. So, so welcome all the uh, <laughs> debate and interest there if there is any. Um, we wanna know things like too, what is the most sensitive fact? Like this one fact, if you, get that one wrong, you know, everything is, is wrong, um, is the most wrong. See, you can recover. Um, the two, two mechanisms I, I mentioned allow you to recover from bad or missing facts. So inductive logic programming lets you fill in a connection or link between two variables, uh, which you might not have had before, but 
by looking over uh, all the patterns of many examples, you can go, oh, you know what? Roger Federer is a tennis player. Um, you know, uh, so you, I might not have had that fact explicitly, but for many other uh, examples, I could go, well, you know, uh, people who, who uh, are tennis racket sponsors tend to be tennis or tennis racket uh, <laughs> advertisement people or tend to be tennis players and so on. So, um, and the other mechanism is deduction. Deduction, you know, lets you conclude by going around to other facts. Um, you know, uh, a, a high probability possibly of a, of a fact. So, for example, I may not have in my knowledge base that Roger Fender is a tennis player, but I may know that he played Rafael Nadal in a tennis match. So if I know that, I could maybe conclude he must be a tennis player. So, <clears throat> okay, so um, uh, other related things, you know, we have eventually a limited amount of space. So what is the best uh, fact to forget that, or because I can still recover? And this can all be, I think, cast a little bit in terms of uh, permutation and variances. Um, so here's another set of things. So uh, believe information might be able to tell us something about the search order for optimal premise selection, meaning if I'm trying to determine something like is Roger Federer a, I put a logical query in is Roger Federer a tennis player? Well, I've, you know, whatever, 5 billion nodes in uh, in, in DBpedia that I can start with. I can start with the fact that the sun is uh, round and, <laughs> you know, uh, try to work my way over. So, so uh, there's something, you know, in the inherent uh, relationships of information that might tell us something about uh, the search order. Um, these things are really important to us. These are actually more general than just LNN, but um, how you do generalization in the presence of knowledge that the underlying distribution comes from a grammar, for example, in language or vision. Um, and uh, uh, again, this relies on, or we're playing with something that uh, involves permutation equivalences. And it's, you know, you should be able to show us the intuition that you can generalize with very many fewer examples if you have that extra knowledge that the underlying system is grammatical or hierarchical. Um, related to that, multitask learning, which tasks are ver or variables, these are synonyms in this literature, um, their models, if you have them already, help us with current the current task or variable. This apparently is not very well uh, articulated in the literature from what we've seen. Now, uh, going very big in scope, which is well beyond LNNs, is um, we have an, uh, an effort on reformulating the, the entire foundations of mathematics by not casting things at the very origin as sets, but as bits. And related to that, you know, what about qubits? Could qubits be a foundational construct? Um, and then finally, uh, this is a getting into, you know, also very uh, difficult ground, but trying to actually measure um, a, a uh, the, the amount of general intelligence you have in your system, um, using the idea of the shortest program to, uh, to uh, solve that uh, skill or task. Okay, so this is just meant to uh, stir some discussion and outreach, but uh, that's it. So here's a little summary. If you wanna find out some more, um, either scan this or go to this page. And this is actually all fairly hot off the press. Um, so it's all very rapidly being developed. So we're definitely looking for any uh, interested uh, parties from uh, all disciplines, basically. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have some time for questions. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please go ahead. So maybe I start. 
I have several questions, but probably we will do it offline. Here's one, your last slides, you connected information logic and the neuron there with that computation. But here's the question that bothered us 10 years ago when we started our Center for Science and Information, trying to understand semantic information. So just to give you a naive example, if I have two texts, one in Russian, one in English, and these two texts is a translation exactly one of the others. If I apply any probabilistic information approach to this, entropy, whatever you want, you get two different things. But semantically, they have the same information. Actually, this, this graph that you show, the, the connection of this logic connecting, you know, Roger Feather, Switzerland, and so on, I think Kevin Knuth from Albany was trying to do it to, to actually somehow extract a little more about the semantics information. Do you have any view on this? I just wonder whether this could not be used actually to advance our understanding more of semantic logic, whatever you want to call. Do you mean giving a semantics to information values or do you mean uh um the connection between so, so this is a good question yes i i don't okay so let's say again let's do some simple example when i have two texts that talk about the same about let's say both are talking about roger feather and when he was born but they are written in different languages if if you apply any entropy-based approach, you won't go too far. You get two different values. But if you apply the logic and you try to do this extraction through this connecting on inference, you might get actually to say that they contain the same semantic information, at least. I'm not talking even about value at this point. So that's how I, uh, I would like to uh, phrase it. Okay, good, good. You're touching on many things, uh, very many deep things with that question, I think. So one thing is represented here maybe, which is sort of what is the minimum, um, what are the minimum facts that you need? And uh, sort of relates to that because, you know, um, when you express things in words, you're, there's words, languages and then there's you could say the fundamental logic underneath them and one hope with this approach that we have that i didn't i, I went rather quickly through our approach to language but it's arguably very um uh um it, it's a completely different road than what than the way nlp is doing things today NLP, you could say, is going from words to words, whether it's translation, um, which is one something related to what you're talking about, or uh, question answering, which is going from questions to answers. Today's deep learning is trying to map words to words. We're trying to go, we, have, we insert a middle step, which is logic. We go from words to the fundamental concepts, represented in a certain way, of course, and then from those to back to words. So, so question one way to or one ver, one question related to what you're saying maybe is um you know different languages express the underlying logic differently um and you know so the in fact things like amr which is one of our intermediate representations here were invented to try to be a lingua franca between languages um mm -hmm. a logical a somewhat logical representation uh, that sort of distills the basic facts underneath. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot to study here in terms of differences in language, languages, and uh, you know, uh, the amount of information you could say uh, in the in, in all of these transition steps, you know, uh, the differences in information like. Uh, yeah, um, are, is English expressing in a less information efficient way or more information efficient way than Spanish or, or whatever? There are many, many versions of, of the question that uh, 
once you once you try to have an intermediate representation that distills explicitly the knowledge or information. So I was trying to actually somehow connect logic and information. There are few places to say, but logic is inherently important for information and was not really used. So logic, for example, constrains the number of, of opportunities, possibilities that it immediately is related to somehow to information. This is something that the workshop that I mentioned to you, we are trying to explore it. But I'm talking enough. Maybe there are some other questions. Yes, Vartek, I have a question if that's fine. This is uh, Rupsha Samanta. So uh, thanks for a really nice talk. This is very cool work. Uh, I work in formal methods and programming languages and in particular in program synthesis. And uh, you pr might probably know that program synthesis and uh, symbolic AI have had various points in their uh, historical developments when they have merged. For instance, in the 1970s, there was a lot of work in, in perhaps part of the AI community on uh, logic programming, uh, 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 where the goal was to synthesize logic programs from input output examples. So uh, these areas have generally uh, diverged for the mo most part, uh, but now uh, they seem to be converging again. There is a lot of work now on uh, what is called neurosymbolic program synthesis. Uh, I have actually included a reference in the chat here. Um, there was also the deep coder work from Microsoft Research. There was some work by Riedel uh, on differentiable programmable interpreters back in 2015 and so on. So um, how do you see your, uh, how do you see logical neural networks uh, in, in the context of uh, these uh, neuro-symbolic approaches for, uh, re for program synthesis? Yeah, yeah, great, um, great question. So I, I love this whole uh, connection to program. So um, one way to think about it, this, this thing that we're showing here on language, natural language, you could change the input uh, there's a version of it where you change the a natural language to a formal language, like a program. So in fact, it's arguably easier because you don't have all the ambiguity of natural language. So you could replace, instead of input, you could have the input be natural language and the output be formal language. So that would be, you know, programming by uh, speaking. <laughs> um, you could have you know, lang formal language, input, formal language, uh, different formal language, output. So it'd be language to language translation, um, you know, COBOL to C++. So those are all of high interest. And uh, we started thinking about those things. In fact, that was one of the, my original motivations for this whole thing was uh, automated programming. So, but the, the key difference between our approach and some of the things you mentioned is similar to the qualitative difference in the natural language setting. We take as the intermediate representation logical concepts. So we would translate a program, which we think of as just words um, in some language, to the underlying concepts. Like, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to extract something from a database. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then I spit that out to different words in some other programming language. So our, our big philosophical difference with all of those approaches is we don't go from words to words. We go from words to concept to words. I see. I see. Um, yeah, most of these approaches actually don't even go from words to words. They, they take uh, training data, so input output examples. Uh, some of there is some work on using NLP inputs, but I mean natural language inputs, but it's all typically examples. And I think the intermediate representation in many cases is uh, is a continuous function, right? So I, I, it's not clear if there are concepts being uh, inferred uh, in the inputs. So so you know I I'm using the analogy with natural language. So like many of these things use a end-to-end -end training examples where you have an input program in one language and an output program in another language, say, if you're doing translation. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, to me, I just consider them. That's the same idea as words to words. I see. Yeah. And I don't know if we'll have time to talk later, but I just wanted to mention that my group has some uh, work on using properties such as permutation uh, invariants uh, to enhance inductive program synthesis, where the goal is to generate programs from a small handful of input output examples. And we already have work that uh, shows that we need few examples if we know some such property holds of the desired program. So I can add a pointer to the work in the chat. Oh yeah, that'd be great. And I'd, I'd love that connection. So uh, yeah, let's definitely follow up. Sure, thanks. Any, Chris, you have a question? Okay, any other question? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, well, a, a comment and a question that kind of comes with it, which is, and, and this gets back to Wojtek, your statement about language. And one of the things is that language kind of, there are other things captured in the language other than concepts. As an, as an example, if I have a same fact represented in two different languages and in one language, it's represented in a way that alliterates well or, or rhymes, uh, it will be more memorable to humans in that particular language. And so some of these, these ideas about the, about the language itself may carry some sort of information separate from the logical fact uh, that's going on. And I'm wondering if in, in some of your work with embeddings, is it possible that, that things, Things like that, things that the that are important in language that may not be related to the fact being represented, uh, will carry into this. And is that going to, uh, you know, somehow be helpful, or is that likely to confound things and and make this uh, conversion into a logical reasoning more difficult? Uh, my, we haven't gone into that. That to me is uh, extra fancy. Um, <laughs> so to me, I'm, uh, uh, I, I think there was a name for this particular school of thought, um, constructivist or something. I, I believe that we need to sort of tear down, we're trying to do very hard problems all at once, all in one go by having a giant, you know, whatever, one billion neuron model in the middle. Uh, between some input and some output, so so you know that you could approach something like that today, even with neural nets. But um, I'm trying to construct things, you know, from the basics. So first, try to understand the kind of simple robotic meaning <laughs> of things. But what you're talking about is, you know, like when I took Latin in college, Latin is extra hard because. It's very poetic. You know, there's so all these different ways to say the same thing in Latin, but but because of all the connotation, poetic connotations, and uh, and so on, and being artistically brief, and <laughs> so, so so I see that as it is very important. Uh, it's sort of that would be the final level. That would be like you know when you're when when you've completely mastered you're just basically understanding what the words are trying to say. Um, then the higher level of the meta meaning kind of of how you've strung together the words and that would be the, the, the final, you know, conquest of language by computers to me, something like that, what you're describing. But I think we're far from that. I'm just trying to, um, you know, even do simple things like this 33%, which, you know, we didn't beat by much. We are the state of the art, but we just barely edged out so far and on one of the data sets we've got quite a large gap but you know basic things like what is the information being asked for when when the words are you know it was roger federer born in the united states that <laughs> we can't even do that yet so we can't uh you know i mean we as a field we're we're, we're getting you know uh still less than 50 percent on on these simple kind of factual questions, but but that is my goal. Something you're saying, but that's like my dream. <laughs> I guess, and I guess what I'm wondering there is is the this idea that you're going to going to bring embeddings into this model is 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 this perhaps one of the things that 
that causes problems there, that, that language carries more with it than simply the, the facts that we want it to. Oh, yeah, absolutely right. I think, well, today's approach without logical neural nets or the default approach with embeddings is just using examples of sentences. So all of that artistry and, and so on that's, it, that's captured in the specific words that people use is, is kind of convolved in the problem, in the training data. So uh, to me, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a confounder. It's actually kind of adding noise is in effect because when you're just trying to get the information now, which we are still at that level. <clears throat> Okay, any other question? Okay, let's thank Alex. Alex, thank you very much. It was great, very illuminating. Uh, I think we'll be in touch. Thank you very much again. All right, thanks everyone for the time. Thank you.